Recently, I create a lot of tutorials about individual PixInsight processes. And that's about the same as individual Lego blocks. And it's great to know how they look like, how they work and how you can use them. But it is also crucial that you know how you can build them together to something that works and that the output is something beautiful. And with this set of tutorials, of which this is the initial one, I want to achieve exactly that. To put now all these different learnings into a whole and show you the perfect process to come from a stacked picture to the final picture, which you can frame and put on the wall. Hey, this is View Into Space. I'm Sascha from Switzerland. So grüezi miteinander and thanks for watching my channel. So as this is the initial tutorial, let me first explain you how I see the world when we talk about processing. And it doesn't really matter if it's one shot color or if it's mono. And we start today with a standard RGB process. So this means in principle, you take one photo that you shot either with a color camera or with separate RGB filters, which you combine and then you process it all together as one. You would usually do that either for star clusters or do not want to go through the effort of ripping it apart and processing the parts separately. But from my perspective, there is one part which you always process separately. Be it that you have actually recorded it separately or be it that you just rip it apart and then process it separately. And that is the stars. And for that, I've already done a special tutorials about how to process the stars. You find the link in the description below. And now these series of tutorials, which I do now are in principle on the opposite side. So you combine one of these object tutorials with the star tutorial and together you get then one final picture. So what are the other options beside RGB? First of all, there is the classical narrowband processing, which is either HOO, if you make your photos with a color camera and the dual narrowband filter, or it's HOS, if you're shooting mono and you have dedicated filters for all the three emissions, or on the color side, if you are using, in addition, the new ASCAR Color Magic filter, which actually covers O3 and S2. So you also get through all three emissions. So with this method, you still have about the traditional colors, but given that you process each channel separately, you get a much better picture. The next step within the narrowband area is then the Hubble palette, or any other false color palette which is existing, and there are a lot of them. And then last but not least, if we're shooting galaxies, we can obviously also do that the RGB way, but a method which is really popular these days is the HAGB, which means beside the RGB, we also shoot with the HA filter, and then we replace the red with the HA. So from my point of view, these are the main processing workflows we use today. But if you know something else that you feel I left out and that should be covered, please leave it in the comments below. Highly interested. With that, let's go back to the RGB because that's what we're here for today. And that's what we now step by step will actually do. If you want to recreate through the video what I've been doing, please take any picture. And that's the great part about RGB. You can do it with anything, with a star cluster, with a galaxy, with a nebula, doesn't matter. So take whatever you want to process and just follow me along. And we will meet now on my computer. If you have already seen my star tutorial, then if the first few steps will now be a little bit repetition. But I feel it's still important that we start from the very beginning. So what you see here are two pictures, two stacked pictures, linear 
of Fleming Strangler Wisp once recorded with a dual narrowband filter with an exposure length of 180 seconds. The second one of the same object taken with a broadband light pollution filter an Optolong L Pro with 60 seconds per exposure. So this exposure here will be utilized exclusively for the stars and this exposure here will be utilized exclusively for the nebula. Now this is the optimal case. If you're processing all pictures where you do not have a separate set for the stars, you can always simply extract them from the main picture. You anyway have to do that and then use the star mask to proceed with it. So the first thing we have to do and the most important thing is that we register these two pictures together if we have not done that already before. For that we go to process, image registration and then star alignment. And here is this process. So what we have to do, star picture we use as the reference image, put it here. And the nebula we use as the target image. With that we already have done everything. We take the triangle, shoot it on a picture. Okay, and that's done. We can close the process, we stretch this one. So it's identical to this one, but if we put these two now on top of each other, they match a 100%, and that's the important part. So the next thing we have to do is the dynamic crop. And the crucial part here is that we crop both pictures exactly the same. Otherwise, we lose the registration. So we go to process, geometry, and dynamic crop. I would suggest that you crop the picture first, which is worse, which is obviously here, this one. So as usual, what we're doing, we're pressing the reset button. Now we're starting to minimize the field to where we want to have it. Okay, and if it would be only this picture, this is about how we would crop it, right? But now we have to be careful because we also have to ensure that all the black parts on the other picture are also taken care of. So here we're fine. This part is actually here. That's not an issue. But you see this part here, we don't have it here. Here it's fine. So actually I have to, to move this here also to the back so that it's taken care of this part and that should be okay now. Otherwise it's fine. So now don't press yet the execute button, but take the triangle and put it on the background that we get this here. Once this is done, you can press the execute button and it will crop it. So now what we're doing, we can actually close this one here. We're selecting the other picture and we're opening this stored process here. And you see that it puts the same box over here as was here. So all we have to do now is press execute and now we have absolutely matching pictures without black frames around them. And with that these two pictures go now very different routes. For the star picture please watch the star tutorial and follow along that one to get this to the final state. We will minimize that now and fully concentrate now on the nebula. So the first thing we have now to do with the nebula is get rid of the gradients in the background. Now here we do not have any vignetting, we have only a light gradient which goes from dark to bright. Now there's different philosophies. Some people say in cases like that the automatic background extractor works better or is at least sufficient. But my take is whenever we want to do a high quality picture, we always choose the best processes. And it's kind of logical that when you actually manual set the samples, you just should actually get a better result than when it's just done randomly by the computer. So we go to process, background modelization and choose the dynamic background extraction. So we click on the picture, we're setting our first sample, for example here, and we look at the size. Now, given there are not too many stars here, we can take a reasonable size, but not too big because we also have a lot of nebulosity. We can change that here in default sample radius. I would say we could go here with a 25, resize all, 
and so we'll use that. So now I start to set samples. And there's the eternal question, how many? From my point of view, as much as I feel like. Not too many, not too few. It's more like where there's an opportunity. I just go around. Whenever I see a nice spot, for example, I set it. Okay, in the meantime, I have set all the samples that I wanted to set. So now we have here this very colorful picture and we have to get it to a very less colorful picture. And we do that with the tolerance. I usually start with about two. Let's see what happens. And it already looks pretty good, but it could be a little bit more. Let's say 2.5. Now most of the pixels are very dim. We go to a three. And now even these start to disappear. Let's go through them. It looks really good. So I'm happy with that. We do not have very dark places, so I don't have to change here the shadow relaxation. But the smoothing factor, given that this is a very smooth transition, there's nothing harsh in it. So I can really smooth it out. I can go to about 0.8. And now I go down to the target image correction and I choose subtraction because the division I would only choose if there would be some harsh vignetting. With that, everything's fine. Nothing else has to be selected. I execute it. We get two pictures back. This here is our new picture. Very nice. The gradient is gone. And we see that also here, where we can see now the gradient that was removed. So we're closing down the dynamic background extraction. We're closing down the original picture. We do not need that anymore and we continue working with the one where we extracted the background. So the next thing we want to do is we want to use the spectrophotometric color calibration, the brand new tool. And to do that, we have to plate solve the picture. That's also one of the changes. Now, how do we do that? So I stacked my picture outside of PixInside. I use, as some people of you already know, AstroPixel processor for stacking. So when I now import the stacked picture into PixInsight, the plate solving is non-existent. In addition, if you, even if you would have stacked it in PixInsight, as soon as you have done the dynamic crop, the solution is gone. So no matter if you like me stack outside or if you stuck with the WBPP, at the end you have to plate solve. So now the only problem with plate solving is usually, especially in a picture like that, which does not really dead center, have a star cluster or anything which you can easily classify to find the coordinates. And they're not in this picture, given that out of whatever reason, AstroPixel processor does not include it in a stacked picture. So how do we get to that? Now, what I did, I took here a single exposure. So this is a non-stacked single exposure. And this holds all the information that I need. I go now up to process, image, and then fits header. So I now choose this single exposure here. And you see, if I scroll down, here are all the coordinates that I need. Nice. So all I have to do now, I take here the triangle and throw this whole thing on my stacked picture. Done. So now all that is actually needed to plate solve is now contained in the metadata of my stacked picture. So the next thing I have to do, I click on script, image analysis, and image solver. That's the new way how to plate solve. So you see here, the coordinates, they're already in here. The date when I shot it is in here. My focal distance and the pixel size is already in here. It's all done. So literally all I have to do now is to execute. And my picture is successfully plate soft. All fine. So with that, there's nothing in the way to start a new process. And we find it in process, spectrophotometry, and spectrophotometric color calibration. So let's go one by one through it. White reference, I choose photon flux. In the documentation, it's written that if you use a dual narrowband filter, that's what you should choose. 
So I do it. Huey curve the same in the documentation. If you use the dual narrowband filter, choose ideal Huey curve and not the Huey curve of your camera. So I'll do it. Red, green and blue filter. I leave it like that. Narrowband filter mode. I choose that one. And now the frequencies are already correct. In the dual narrowband filter, you choose for the red filter, the wavelength of HA. And the green and the blue filter, you choose the wave wavelength of O3. Now I have an Antlia ALPT, which has a bandwidth of five nanometers. So I have to change that. I do not optimize for stars given that I have a huge object in there, the nebula. And now with the background neutralization, given we have a lot of nebulosity in here, it's actually a good thing to tell the process where the background is. For that, we make a preview. I find that up here, that's really a nice patch where there's no nebulosity, no colorization. So I will choose a tiny little bit of this. I look at that, yes, that looks really nice as a background. So I will choose here, region of interest from preview. I choose my preview. Okay, and that's done. With that, we're ready. We're throwing the triangle on there. Okay, and it's done. So if we look at the white balance function, we have it very nicely on here. So that all looks good. We close that down. We restretch the image and here it is. So the next thing we're doing is SCNR. So we close this down and here is my SCNR. I do not use the regular SCNR, which is included in Pix Inside and which you would find in Process Noise Reduction SCNR, but I use the one from Bill Blanchon and I will leave the link to that in the description below. I use a lot of these pixel mass processes from Bill. He's really one of the most innovative contributors to Pix Insight at the present time. So he states that his SCNR gives the better luminance protection than the regular one. So I throw this one on here. And we have it done. So the next step is a crucial one. We're removing now all the stars. If you have a separately recorded set of stars, you can simply discard the stars. If you do not have that, you will have also to create a star map and then use that to continue with the other workflow and process the stars. So now there's two possibilities if you want to remove the stars. The one option is Starnet++ and the other is the Star Exterminator. Starnet++ is free. Star Exterminator does cost $60. The advantages are Star Exterminator is much more precise and it's also faster. But at the end, both are valid choices. Whatever you choose, as I said, if you still need the stars, if you want to reprocess your own stars here in the main picture, you need to select Generate Star Image. In my case, I can simply say Hasta la Vista to the stars and deselect that. I throw the triangle on there. With that, Star Exterminator has done its magic. So the Star Exterminator has done a rather good job, except this corner here. And a very few little stars down here, but that's less a problem than here. And to be very clear, I don't want to blame here the Star Exterminator. It's just my crappy stars <laughs> who actually made this happen. And now before I get a lot of comments that I have a back focus issue, I know I have a back focus issue. And unfortunately, to this day, I could not fully solve it. Also, given this was really a horrific fall, since about two months, I didn't have really a chance to still experiment with it. So this is still my quest to solve my back focus issue, but still I wanna present you my tutorials with my own data and not kind of brag with someone else's data. <laughs> so anyway, it's a good example. What do you do now? So you have two options. Either you just leave it as it is, which is okay because the other stars afterwards will land on top of them. So it definitely doesn't look crappier than before. But what you also can do, you can take a process called clone stamp. It's the usual clone tool that you also find in any other image processing software. It's just not as good. <laughs> it's 
So if, if you look at my detailed process tutorial about clone stamp, you will realize I'm not really happy with this tool. But at the end of the day, for something like that, it absolutely does the trick. So how do you work with it? You actually have to guess a radius. We could say now we take a radius of 30. The softness we leave, the opacity we leave. And now we have with control click, we have actually to define from where we take the source, let's say here. And now we move it on top of these stars. And like that, we kind of remove them by hand. So, you know, this is one of these areas where you can say when you do that, do you really intervene in the picture? Do you remove the reality? I personally would say, given that we actually put these stars on top again, it's not really taking the reality away. It's just completing the job in principle, which the star exterminator has not been able to fully do. So, and the biggest mess is now gone. These small things, they don't really matter. So with that, I'm actually okay. We have now to click the execute button that it's really happening. So that happened and we can actually close the clone stamp. So the next thing we're gonna do, we remove the noise. And I think when we look at a preview, let's do another preview, for example, here, we nicely see that we actually have a lot, a lot of noise in this picture. So we wanna get rid of that noise. Now you have many options to do that. On one side, if you go process, noise reduction, you find a few different picks inside internal processes which you can use. For example, the multi-scale linear transform or the ACDNR. Another alternative is if you go to script and you have the easy processing suite installed, you can go with the easy denoise. These are all viable solutions, but the absolute ultimate best solution is the noise exterminator. And it's not as close as with the star exterminator and star net plus plus, where you could say both kind of do the job, one does it a little bit better, but here noise exterminator is miles better than any other solution. And each and every review you can watch here on YouTube tells exactly that. There is no better noise extractor than the noise exterminator. So from my point of view, yes, it costs $60 but it's very, very well invested money. And if you have it, all you have to do is throw the triangle on there, let it run, and it's really blazing fast. And if you check now, this is just smooth. Really great stuff. So noise extraction done and dusted and bye noise exterminator until the next time. So the next thing we have to do is we have to stretch and that's probably the most important step of the whole process. A lot of people think this is something to do lightheartedly, just take the screen transfer function and, and that's fine. But actually a, a good stretch can make a big difference. So for the stretch, you have different tools from the screen transfer function to the histogram transformation to the easy soft stretch. But even it's a complex method, the generalized hyperbolic stretch is by far the best way how to stretch. And in the new picks inside, you have it now by default installed under intensity transformation and generalized hyperbolic stretch. So you do not have to download the script anymore. And that's a big advantage. So in the frame of this tutorial, I can only scratch the surface. And it makes sense if I can convince you with this tutorial to use the generalized hyperbolic stretch that you actually look an in-depth tutorial about, at the moment it's probably still about the scripts, but it's about the same, about this method. So before we actually start, the first thing you have to do is you have to remove the screen transfer function. It has to be black. The next thing we're doing, we press here the plus button and we get the curve now. Now rather close to the right side, you click and you get this yellow line. You see now this value that we calculated, you click now on send to SP and this value is sent down here. Now local intensity, 
you increase it for the first stretch to about nine. Okay. Now we need a preview that we're actually seeing what we're doing. And now we actually remove the zoom, we put this down to one again. And now we can actually start to stretch with the stretch factor. And we're doing that until the curve is around here or a little tiny bit further. So we're not going to the 25% mark. We stay in the area of 20%. And that's already good for the first stretch. Now all we have to do is to click the execute button and the stretch is done. We obviously have to reset now. And here it is. That's our first stretch. Now we're doing the same again. So we just click again in this curve. We say send to SP. We go with the local intensity to about five. So it's now the second stretch. So we don't want to do it that intense anymore. And now we again start to increase the stretch factor. And now you see the nebula comes to life. And now also here, the model, less is more, makes absolutely sense. So don't overstretch it. <laughs> but keep it rather a bit, little bit less than you would have. I think about this looks amazing. The advantage is with having the stars mostly gone, that there's a very little chance that you actually blow something out, that something goes over the value of one. If you have a feeling this could happen, you can always protect highlights actually, move this lever a little bit, but Personally here, I'm not scared at all. So with that, for the second time, we press the execute button. We reset again. And so what we're doing now, we're shifting gears. We go now from the generalized hyperbolic stretch to linear, which is nothing more or less than what you would do with the histogram transformation. And what we're doing here now, you see this low clip. As long as it's zero, I don't clip anything. And what I can do now, I can now simply down here, instead of the last zero, I just enter one, press enter. What it does now, it actually goes down to the moment where it clips. So I practically have not clipped anything, but my background is now as black as possible. Now, do I like that? Actually, not really, it's too dark. So I can always go now to the black point and move it up to my liking. And I think around this here should be good. But you see the point was simply by doing that with a low clip, we saw as a reference how far we actually could go down with a black point without losing any information. Now going up is absolutely okay. And I think this picture looks now nicely stretched. With that, I will execute for the last time and close the generalized hyperbolic stretch Close the preview. And here we have our stretch picture now. For the next three steps, we want to focus on the nebula and not on the background because the background is more or less okay the way it is. So for that, we will actually put now a mask on the background. And for that, we go to process, mask generation and range selection. We open the preview, it's completely white. And now we just put this lever here slowly to the right. And now you see the nebula shape is coming. You can just compare here what we're doing. And we rather want to be generous. So we don't want to protect too much. So we just keep it a little bit more open. We also make it now a little bit fuzzy that we do not have any harsh edges. A little bit more smooth. But when we do that, we also have now again to open it up more. And I think that's about what we want. So with that, I will say execute. We can now close the preview. And here we have our mask. I take it now here and throw it on the picture. Minimize the mask, move it that away. So now you see the nebula still there. The, the background is protected. I will now hide the mask by pressing this icon that I actually see what I'm doing. And now we can start to work on the nebula. And the first out of this three sequence is the saturation. Let's see if we have to increase or decrease the saturation a little bit with certain colors 
to get it to a nicer shape. For that, I go to process, intensity transformation, and color saturation. And here we go. So the cool part about the color saturation is that I can actually, for each color separately, change the saturation to my liking. So the first thing that I'm doing now is opening a preview so that I'm seeing what I'm doing. Next thing, I want to have the red because there's mostly red here. I want to have the red in the middle. And I do this with the U-shift. So I change the U-shift until I have the red in the middle. I have the blue convenience. I don't really care about the green. So the green, the green can be here in the outside. With that done, I take now here the line and I put it just a little bit up. Let's see, that's probably already too much from a red point of view. But from a blue point of view, for example, I rather like it. So in the middle of the red, I put now here a point, a dot, and I move it a little bit down. I don't want to go down more in the middle, otherwise I would decrease actually the saturation. But from a red point of view, we probably do not need much more saturation. But from a blue point of view, and blue is about here, we could even go a little bit more up. So let's see what we have done. We can even put the blue a little bit more up. And I can move the red even a little bit lower. And actually, I like that because the red is red enough. But I have now a little bit more blue in there. And that, that's what I wanted. So once I'm happy with it, I stay to execute. And that's done. So we can close the color saturation. We can also close the preview. And here we are. It's a subtle change, but I like to have a little bit more blue in there. With that, we want to add now a little bit more contrast. Now you might have realized that there's no contrast function as such in PixInsight. It's just because it's under a very strange name. It's called Local Histogram Equalization. And you find it also in Process, Intensity Transformation, and here it is. Also here, the first thing we do, we get a preview that we're seeing what we're doing. And the preview looks extremely bad, <laughs> extremely shocking if you look at it, but, but just ignore that for a moment. So the first thing, we want to change the contrast of two areas of the large structure, so of the nebula as a whole in principle, of the whole arms and so on of the nebula, and then the small structure, just the little tiny details. For the large structure, we go down here up with the kernel radius to about 150. And you see it immediately changes. Now, obviously, this is completely over-processed. So now with the contrast limit, we go down to about 1.5. Let's have a look at it. And if we now compare it, it already has a lot more contrast, probably still a little bit too much. My favorite number usually is around 1.3. Below 1.3, it's practically indistinguishable. Above 1.3, it just acts overprocessed. So you can see that's really a big game changer from a contrast point of view, but it's not shocking. So now with the amount, we can actually define how much of this new contrast picture we want to have in here and this and how much we want to have the original one. At the moment, it's just the contrast picture, and that's still too harsh. So when I now move down here, it already looks much better. So now it's just this little tiny bit of additional contrast without that it actually acts over processed. We can even go a tiny little bit more down, I would say. So let's just try that. And yeah, that's now natural. It's just a little bit sharper. So I'll execute that. Okay, then we reset the whole thing. And now we want to go into the small structure. Let's just for a second close the preview. So to see actually what we're doing, we need now to actually have a preview. So let's get a preview at an area where we still want to improve it. For example, here, all this stuff might be quite interesting to see how it changes. So let's get a preview, not too small, but not too big just that we see nicely what's going on. Let's look at it. That's perfect. So let's get a preview of that. First of all, we go down again to about the metric number, 1.3, so that we see in a relevant matter what's actually happening here. You see again, it's a little bit better, but it's not crazy. 
And what we can do now still is with the kernel radius, we can see what this has for an effect. If I move it down, And you see here now, when we're actually comparing it, it really brings out these structures more. So that the 22 might actually be a very good number here to get really into the details. We're again smoothing the whole thing down. Let's look at it again. And that's actually nice. So let's do that. Let's close now the preview. Let's close this process. Much more contrast now, much more defined than Ebola. I really like that. Now the last thing which you could do, but let's see if it's even necessary here, would be sharpness. So you find this in process, convolution, whatever it's here, and unsharp mask. Again, we're opening the preview and let's see. Quite honestly, I do not even really see a lot of difference anymore. Let's go to a three. And with a three, I get an additional sharpness. But the question we really have to ask ourselves here with the nebula, do we want that? Because a nebula is, as it said, it's soft. So if we make it too pronounced, too harsh, it's first of all, not reflecting the reality. And it might also just not be really the character of the nebula. So I will not do any sharpening here anymore. I was already able with the contrast to do enough. But just to state, that's another option if you still feel it's needed. With that, we also do not need anymore the mask. We should never forget that we have a mask on there. So we go to mask, remove mask. There's nothing visible, but you see this here was kind of brownish before. Now it's gray again, means there's no mask on it anymore. Last we can do some final tweaks with the curve transformation. For that, we go to process, intensity transformation, curve transformation. And again, like before, this is on a neat basis. It's not etched in stone that you have to change anything anymore if you like the picture as it is. But it's always good to validate that it's the best as it could be. So. Usually at this stage, I rather make it with the curve transformation a little bit darker, especially in the background than brighter. So I usually go down here. I personally like dark backgrounds, but that's really a question of taste. So you see, it's just much, much punchier now, perhaps even a little bit too much. So I will go up again a little bit. Yeah. But I just is this final punch. <laughs> I like that. And that's already everything I want to do here. So with that, let's also execute that. Let's close the preview. And with that, we actually are at the end of our object picture. So now what we need is our star picture. And I hope you have it ready. If you do not have it ready, please stop the video here. Get your star picture ready and then come back. And here is my star picture. And I personally like it just as it is, as stars. So now the next thing we have to do is we have to combine these two pictures together with pixel mass. For that, we go to process, pixel math, pixel math. When it comes to combining two pictures, there is a misconception that the best formula would simply be starless plus stars or starless divided by two plus stars divided by two. And the problem with these formulas is that that leads to wrong colorization, star bloating and so on. Definitely not a good idea. So this is actually the formula that should be used. And that's also the way that the star mask is created, just obviously the inverse one, when actually, for example, with the star exterminator, the star mask is created. So I labeled now one picture stars, the other starless. And now we can just press here the execute button and we get the stars in here. Now it's nice. It's perhaps a little bit unusual to have so many stars in a picture with the nebula, 
personally, I like having stars and also colorful stars in the picture because that's the reality out there. It's not real just having the nebula or just having a few single stars. But what I really don't like, even it might be the reality, is stuff like this that have actually stars within the nebula because that really looks kind of disturbing and messes up the whole nice beauty of the nebula. So my way, how I deal with that, and again, you know, we're deviating here somehow from reality, but from my point, it's okay, it's acceptable. So let's see. So I made here a copy. Let's call this now Starless 2. Okay. So now what I'm going to do, I go again to process, mask generation, range selection. So let's start again, creating a mask. But this time around, I really want to reduce it to the core, to the strongest parts of the nebula and no more. Something like this. So I smooth it out now again a little bit. A little bit fuzzier. And you see it even takes less away and that that's intended that's good great and here we go here i have now this mask great minimize it and now i inverse it so now the nebula is protected but the rest not and just really the core of the nebula now we said this is starless too and now let's just execute that Okay, let's remove the mask. Let's have a look. So this is the, the traditional, the in quote, real way. And this is my way. So you see, there's still a lot of stars. But given that I removed them from the nebula, first of all, the nebula is undisturbed. And it looks like it's in the foreground while the stars are in the background. And I like this much, much better. This looks too chaotic to me. So I will continue with this one, but this is also a very personal choice. The other one is probably closer to reality, but this looks nicer. So what do you want, reality or nice looks? It's an individual choice. So at this point of time, there are two things left to do. The first one is now a question of the final crop. So for example, I mean, this is still yucky yucky down here uh, and here to the right. And so I go now again to process geometry, dynamic crop, and I'm just doing the rest of the crop, what I really don't want. We can also a little tiny bit here. That's just some stars. We don't really, we do not really lose a lot down here, but here I want to keep it. So like this. So it warns me that the astromatic solution will now be deleted. That's okay. We don't need that anymore. So I have now my final form. And now the very, very last thing that you might consider is again, the curve transformation. So intensity transformation, curve transformation. You might, for example, now that it's combined, let's see if it makes sense to still make the background a tiny little bit darker you know I like it dark and yeah that actually that looks very nice so I will do that but that's really now just the very slight adjustment now that these two layers the stars and the nebula are combined so I'm doing that with that I can close it I can close that and ladies and gentlemen this is our final picture and I have to tell you I really really like it and just when we look actually at the picture, it's sometimes good to remember where we came from. We started with that and we ended up with this. So what we have done now is the RGB workflow. Now the question is, given this is a dual narrowband filter picture, will it get better if we deal with the channels separately? Or is this already the best we can achieve with the data available? And this is something we will look at at the next tutorial. But with this now, you have a universal workflow which works with practically everything. And as you can see, the result is quite good. So 
that was quite a long journey that we went now together. But I hope what you got out of it really justifies that. And I hope that these joint workflows, which you learn now about the RGB objects and the stars, is something that you can apply in the future. If you like this video, please give me a like and click the subscribe button below to keep up to date on all the additional tutorials that will come up with through the next weeks. See you next time and clear skies.